can get a copy. Will those in the galleries, gallery please be seated and please keep the aisles and doors clear for safety reasons. The joint session will now come to order. Senate Majority Leader Fenberg. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, uh, I move that the morning roll call of the Senate be made the Senate roll call of the joint session. If there's no objection, the morning roll call of the Senate will be made the Senate roll call for the joint session. Majority Leader Garnett. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Good morning. Members, I move that the morning roll call of the House be made the House roll call of the joint session. If there's no objection, the morning roll call of the House will be made the House roll call for the joint session. A quorum is present. As is customary, it is my privilege and honor to present... Oh, there you are. <laughs> Had to make sure he was there. Um, as is customary, it's my privilege and honor to present this gavel to the President of the Senate with the request that he preside over the proceedings. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Will the Joint Committee, composed of Senators Williams and Cook and Representatives Mullica, Buenteo, and Catlin, please escort the Governor into the House Chambers? It is my pleasure and honor to present to you the Honorable Jared Polis, Governor of the Great State of Colorado. Thank you. Madam Speaker, Mr. President, thank you. Uh, as we confront historical, social, and technological changes throughout our state, throughout our country, I want to start by saying what an honor it is to serve as Colorado's 43rd governor at this juncture, at this moment in time. Before I deliver the state of the state, I want to deliver a message to every child in Colorado that in our state, you can do anything. You can dream, you can dare, and you can do. Here in Colorado, we celebrate our differences, we embrace our uniqueness, and believe that what you look like, where you're from, who you love are less important than what you're like and what you do for your community and your values. So we should all be proud of who we are because all of our futures are full of opportunity. <laughs> to all the new members of the legislature, welcome. I know there's a number of you. And to all the returning members of the legislature, welcome and thank you. And as a special shout out to the historic and record setting number of women who are now 
serving in this building. You know, it's only It's really only fitting that the very first state to elect any women to its state house is now leading the way with a majority of women in our state house and the third consecutive woman as speaker. You know, from the days of Clara Cressingham and Carrie Hawley and Francis Clock to Pat Schroeder, uh, my friend and mentor, uh, Polly Baca, who's with us, and of course, Brianna Tatone and every other trailblazing woman in this chamber today. Colorado's barrier-breaking legacy is truly something that we should all be proud of, Colorado for all. <laughs> President Garcia, Speaker Becker, Leader Holbert, Leader Neville, uh, members of the General Assembly, uh, Lieutenant Governor Primavera, who's no stranger to this chamber, uh, Chairman Harold Cuthair, of the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, Councilman Adam Redd of the Southern Ute Indian Tribe, who also assisted us with the transition, Attorney General Phil Weiser, Secretary of State Griswold, Treasurer Young, Secretary Salazar, uh, members of the State Board of Education, and Justices of the Colorado Supreme Court, Denver Mayor Hancock, and the members of our cabinet, uh, my staff and First Gentleman Marlon Reese, thank you all for being here today and thank you all for your support and good wishes over the past few days. And also thank you for all that you've done for Colorado and all that you will do, uh, both in this session of the General Assembly and beyond. You know, years ago, I uh, sat over there with the members of the State Board of Education uh, and I never thought I would be up here like this as then Governor Bill Owens addressed uh, the state of the state. But you know what? This is Colorado and uh, any of us can do anything. And I hope that you'll all join me in also thanking Colorado's members of the military serving with honor across the globe, the National Guard troops who keep us safe and the Colorado first responders who save lives in our communities day after day. We are grateful for your service and thank you. I also want to specifically acknowledge uh, our Indian nations, the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe Chairman Cuthair and Southern Ute Indian Tribe Councilman Red, who are here with us today. Diane Primavera and I are eager to work with both of you and our tribal nations in the years ahead and to continue strengthening our government-to-government -government, uh, relationship here in Colorado. As all of you know, I stand here with the big shoes of Governor Hickenlooper to fill. But rest assured, I've got my blue sneakers on and I'm ready to keep us moving forward. And you know what? I'm so proud and Colorado is so proud of our amazing Lieutenant Governor, Diane Primavera, a healthcare leader, a former legislator, and uh, one of the toughest people on the planet working with me to help shape Colorado's future. Thank you, Diane. The state of our state is solid, it is strong, it is successful, it is daring, uh, and it is bold. While my predecessor in this legislature certainly deserves some credit for so much of Colorado's progress, we all know, of course, our strength lies first and foremost in the bold and pioneering spirit of the people of our great state. Uh, we all know that here in Colorado, we climb the highest mountains, we look 
far past the horizons we dream, we dare, and we do. And that spirit has been alive and well under the leadership of Governor John Hickenlooper as we overcame tough economic times to build one of the strongest state economies in American history. But I'm not here just to talk about the current state of the state and all the incredible achievements of the past few years. That alone could, could fill the speech. I want to talk about the state of what yet is to come and the great and bright future of our state. Because in the days and months and years ahead, we are here to do more than build on the achievements of the past. We are here to boldly forge a new path into the future to make change work for us rather than against us. It's true that our economy is strong from agriculture to the outdoor recreation industry to aerospace and bioscience and renewable energy and cannabis. We've watched industries succeed and create jobs in our state. We've become a role model of how we can put politics aside and work together. But despite all of our progress, still far too many people are either barely getting by or even falling behind with the rising cost of living. Our administration's mission and mandate from the voters begins with tackling the everyday challenges that Coloradans face because of the rising costs of living and wages that simply haven't kept up. Providing every single child with a quality early education lowering the outrageous cost of health care, creating good paying jobs in the clean energy sector that can never be outsourced, and achieving true tax reform that reduces taxes for hardworking Coloradans instead of giving tax breaks to special interests while forcing families to pay more and more. Together, You know what, together we're going to build an economy where Coloradans from all walks of life across our entire state aren't just struggling to get by but can thrive. Whether, it, whether it's a small business owner in Eagle County whose health care costs are threatening their Colorado dream or the farmer in Fort Morgan whose livelihood is threatened by drought or the parents struggling to pay $400 a month for kindergarten tuition in Douglas County. To these Coloradans across our state, I want to say that our administration will work tirelessly to make our state work better for you so that you can earn a good living, keep more and share in our special way of life. And I know that this legislature will work hard towards the same goals because every single one of us wants to see a Colorado in which everybody can succeed, a Colorado for all. Part of what defines our Colorado way of life are the values that we live by. Values like equality under the law, honesty, the value of hard work and responsibility, the sanctity of basic human rights, and a free market for exchange of goods and services. We see the erosion of some of these values in many quarters of our nation today, which makes them all the more precious for us to protect. Here in Colorado, we treat each other with respect. We reject efforts to intimidate immigrant families or tear children from their parents' arms. We don't tolerate bigotry or discrimination. We we simply don't tolerate bigotry or discrimination of any kind, and we don't accept hostage taking as a form of governance. You know, last summer, Marlon and I were having a conversation with our son, Caspian, who was six at the time. He wanted to know the difference between all the various political parties, uh, Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Socialist, Green, and so on. Um, and at the end, he went over to his four-year-old sister, Cora, and asked her, what political party are you in? And Cora responded without missing a beat, the happy birthday party. <laughs> you know, it was one of those moments that uh, every parent experiences when your child shows you wisdom you can't get uh, from most adults. Uh, I think there are all times that we would all rather be in the happy birthday party. <laughs> 
you know, but that kind of wisdom will guide our approach to problem solving in that administration. Because what truly matters most is not the letter next to your name or your party, which side of the aisle you sit on. What matters are, will our ideas and will your ideas be good for the state of Colorado? That is always the yardstick with which we will measure the legislation uh, you pass regardless of party. Will your ideas reduce health care costs? Will they improve our schools and help get kids a strong start? Will your ideas expand economic opportunity to more Colorado families? That doesn't mean that any of us should ever abandon our, our values. What it does mean is that mere partisanship should never stop us from embracing good ideas and taking bold action for the people of Colorado who elected us to deliver, not to grandstand. So in the spirit of putting problem solving over partisanship, let's work together. We all agree that every child deserves a great education, so let's start there. You know, if we want Colorado to be a place where every person can build a great life for themselves, where our economy can continue to grow, fueled by a skilled workforce, then our schools need to provide students with the tools they need to succeed. You know, one of the greatest joys of my life was starting the New America School and the Academy of Urban Learning, uh, two public charter schools for at-risk youth, and really getting to see firsthand how kids who had fallen through the cracks in our education system could really take off and go on to achieve amazing things uh, when they were given that opportunity. It's time for us to build a Colorado education system where every child, regardless of their zip code, their race, their parents' income, gets a great education that prepares them for a bright future. And, and that begins with preschool and kindergarten, and our top priority this session is empowering every single Colorado community to offer free, full-day kindergarten in our great state of Colorado. We also look forward to working with you to expand the number of free preschool slots to thousands uh, of additional children. Our state's strong economic growth means we have the power to do all of this right now without taking resources away from other critical areas of the budget. And as Uncle Ben once said to Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> and I know that together we can fulfill this responsibility, which many of you, many of you have been working on for years. Uh, free kindergarten now, making full day kindergarten available and accessible for all children, sets kids up to be more successful in school and throughout their lives, saves parents money, it improves performance, it narrows achievement gaps, it leads to earlier identification and intervention for those with special needs and will lead to increasing the high school graduation rate down the road. And we will all share in those benefits. It will save taxpayer money in the long run by improving outcomes and decreasing the achievement gap. It'll strengthen families, our communities, and our economy. But as you know, the state today only funds half-day kindergarten, leaving individual districts and all too often parents holding the bag for the rest. Most districts charge tuition to pay for the extra half-day. Some offer it for free, but only by cutting funding for other priorities like teacher salaries or class size. As a result, kindergarten today in Colorado is a picture of inequality, where some students attend free full day kindergarten, some must pay for tuition, and other families don't get it free and can't afford it because of the cost. In Colorado, families can pay upwards of $500 a month to enroll their kids in full-day kindergarten. And that's money that instead could go to a good home, health care, 
a college fund, retirement savings, starting a small business, or maybe even a nice vacation for their family once in a while. You know what, folks? Oklahoma has figured this out a long time ago, and with all due respect to our wonderful neighbors in the Sooner State, if they can do kindergarten, we can do kindergarten here in Colorado. What we are proposing is a real meaningful expansion of early childhood education. It's an essential first step in our broader strategies for early childhood education and K-12, setting kids up for success right from the start. It'll free up district resources to get us even closer to the ambitious goal of making sure that every child who wants to can go to preschool in Colorado with the families that really you know what, people deserve and we're committed to achieving quality early childhood education. And I want to be clear, when we talk about kindergarten or preschool, that's not a mandate either for parents or for school districts whatsoever. But for parents who believe that public kindergarten or preschool are the best options for their kids and for school districts who want to offer these vital opportunities for families, we here at the state want to work with you to do everything possible to make that happen. <laughs> School districts and education nonprofits, bipartisan state legislators have done amazing work to raise public awareness about the benefits of full day kindergarten, to make it a top priority in this state. Now it is time for us finally to cross the finish line after decades of your work to fund free full day kindergarten by fall of 2019. Let's get it done. Colorado has the fastest growing economy in the country. It's really time our students, our families, and our dedicated teachers uh, shared in that success. And there's several other areas I think we can make real progress uh, in education together uh, by valuing our students and our teachers. Uh, we all know about our educator shortage, particularly in many of our rural and smaller districts. Uh, often having a devastating effect on our public schools. We're approximately 3,000 teachers down from where we need to be, and schools in too many rural communities are feeling the brunt of that, of that impact. And I look forward to working with the legislature to offer student loan relief for teachers who serve in high-need areas to enable more schools to make good on their potential. This, this kind of targeted effort uh, will help provide our children with the very best education and help more hardworking educators afford daily life as indispensable members of the communities where they teach. And as you know, every day we entrust Colorado's educators with our children's safety, with helping them grow into successful, compassionate adults. And educators deserve our respect, our gratitude, and of course, to be compensated as the hardworking professionals that they are. By the way, what a wonderful civic education Diane's beautiful granddaughter is getting. Uh, some of you saw our kids at the uh, inauguration the other day, but we, we uh, tried to return to normalcy and get them back to school. But uh, Diane, your, your granddaughter is going to get some great memories out of this. You know, more than 750,000 Coloradans are carrying over $19 billion in student loan debt. And I think it's important that we do what we can. Uh, to lessen that burden by bringing additional transparency to the student loan process, providing some basic uh, consumer protections uh, for borrowers to do everything we can uh, to make sure that people uh, aren't held back uh, by what they needed to do to afford college. And Another area in education where I think it's critical that we work together to have a major impact is graduation rates. 
uh, a high school diploma is more important than ever before in a 21st century economy. And it's not even just a high school diploma, it's also what skills or pathway you have uh, do career in a growing sector that allows you to support yourself with dignity. And while we've made some progress over the past few years, Colorado is really in the middle of the pack of the states with regard to our graduation rate from high school. Uh, I want to applaud the work of Colorado's Education Leadership Council, which has done admirable work shining a light on this problem and others, as well as examining and recommending how it can be solved. Uh, we need to invest in proven programs that prevent students from falling through the cracks and work with local communities to provide students the support they need to succeed in high school and in life. And that means recognizing that it's often hard for a student to learn if they're hungry or homeless or struggling with trauma or mental illness. And I know that there's a number of thoughtful and innovative proposals here in the legislature to improve behavioral, behavioral health resources for our schools. And I look forward to working with you to help our most vulnerable students overcome the barriers they face and graduate from high school as healthy and productive adults. In this changing economy of the 21st century, a high school degree and skills are absolutely critical for economic success. And if we're going to make sure students are prepared for careers in the booming areas of the Colorado economy, fields like technology and renewable energy, the first step is to look at innovative solutions for reducing the dropout rates and making a high school diploma more meaningful. You know, when our students rise, our state rises even more. Another top priority, one that we know has lit a fire, not only under Coloradans, but under Americans across our country, is the outrageous cost of health care. You know, Governor Hickenlooper in this legislature did admirable bipartisan work years ago, expanding access to affordable health care in Colorado through the expansion of Medicaid uh, and expanding access to vital reproductive health services, as well as cutting the uninsured rate to an unprecedented 6.5% in our state. But despite all that progress we've made, health care costs are still rising. Most of you are recently off the campaign trail too, and I know that Republican or Democrat, you probably heard your constituents complaining about the high cost of health care. I don't think I'm going too far out on a limb <laughs> saying that you probably heard that. And you know what? Families in Colorado, independent Republican, Democrat, Green Libertarian, not even registered, they're all just fed up of, with getting ripped off on health care costs. You know what? It's time for us to fix that. It's, it's, it's time to be bold, folks. It's, it's time. It's time for us to build a health care system that makes sense, where market forces uh, produce savings rather than extra cost, where no person is to choose between losing their life savings in the home or losing their life. It's time for Coloradans to pay a fair price for prescription drugs that they need. It's time for people experiencing mental illness or addiction to get treatment rather than more costly jail time. And in that process of supporting families, we want to make Colorado as family friendly as possible. And as a first step on our budget package uh, coming up next week on the 15th, uh, I will be including a formal request to provide parental leave for all state employees. As, as a father, I know how important those precious first few weeks of life are to be able to spend with your children. And I encourage the legislature, and I look forward to working with you, to take comprehensive action to establish a paid family and medical leave program in Colorado so employees don't have to choose between keeping their paycheck 
and caring for their newborn child or sick relative. And, and look, you know, if, if all of this that we're talking about was easy, it would have all been done already. But progress is hard, and overcoming these challenges will be a journey for all of us. But the people of Colorado need and deserve nothing less than our hard work to overcome the challenges, and our work begins now. Another, another step we're taking uh, to save money on health care is the creation of the first ever Office of Saving People Money on Health Care. <laughs> now, we don't want to give this office a bureaucratic or fancy name to make it sound important. We want to give it a simple name because it is important. Led by Lieutenant Governor Primavera, the Office of Saving People Money on Health Care. <laughs> Will, the Office of Saving People Money on Health Care will form the beating heart of our efforts to reduce patient costs for hospital stays and expenses, improve price transparency, lower the cost of prescription drugs, make health care more affordable and make market forces work for us rather than against us. And I want to say a bit about why Diane is the very best person to take on this challenge. Now, many of you in this chamber had the opportunity to serve with Diane during her four terms in the State House, and those who did got to see her work as one of the fiercest, most knowledgeable patient advocates that we've had. And it comes from her personal experience as a young woman raising her two young kids who are here with us today. Diane was diagnosed with breast cancer and told she had less than five years to live. She knows firsthand how our healthcare system makes getting sick even harder, often by robbing people of their financial security at the same time they're struggling to reclaim their health. Diane survived cancer four times, got well, worked hard for Colorado, raised two amazing daughters who are here with us today, one of whom works for the state, and she's dedicated her life to helping others get quality, affordable health care. We couldn't ask for anyone better to lead our administration's efforts to reduce health care costs. You know, for all, for all survivors, uh, Diane is a fighter and living proof that with strength and courage and resilience, we all in our lives can overcome any obstacle, solve and solve any challenge. As Diane has said, healthcare is something that affects everyone. Doesn't matter your political belief, your faith, or your lack thereof. It's not a partisan issue. Uh, it truly affects everybody. And we've all uh, had family and friends affected. You know, uh, I think another issue gripping our state is we simply must get to work uh, to get a grip on the opioid epidemic, which has taken thousands of lives in our state. Opi opioids, opioids and other illegal drugs have stretched our resources to the breaking point. They've torn families apart. Uh, in 20 and cost lives. In 2017 alone, more than 550 Coloradans died because they overdosed on either a prescription or illegal opioid. And I look forward to working with legislators from both sides of the aisle on solutions that focus on addiction prevention uh, and access to effective treatment because we need to tackle uh, these problems up front uh, to prevent this continual devastation of the opioid epidemic from growing in our state. And, and 
And we must tackle the outrageous healthcare costs fac facing Coloradans in rural and mountain counties in Western Colorado. There's no reason, there is no reason that somebody should lose their home with their savings trying to keep up the cost of health care. There's no reason a family that lives in Glenwood Springs or Gunnison should pay twice as much for health care as a family in the Denver metro area. We will work with you and empower the Division of Insurance to protect consumers and support rural and mountain communities to reduce health care costs. We will work with you to establish a reinsurance program to reduce costs and save Coloradans money. A reinsurance program for the highest cost cases is a proven solution to reduce health care costs. It's worked in other states. It's one we should embrace in Colorado to save small businesses and individuals money. And finally, we will address the appalling and increasing cost of prescription drugs. Canada has the same drugs, often from the same manufacturing plants that we have here in the United States for their residents who need them at a half, a third, even a quarter of the cost. And I look forward to working with this legislature to setting up a way for Colorado to safely import prescription drugs from Canada. The burden that prescription drug costs place on families is too crushing for us not to act boldly and I encourage all of us to do so together. You know, our, of course our ultimate objective is to work together to bring universal, high quality, affordable health care to every family in Colorado. But the work that we do has to begin with reducing costs and saving people money. And we will work together in this legislative, legislative session to do so, to put us on the right path and bring us closer to our bold goal. Because together we can save Coloradans money. We can help small businesses across the state pay less for health care. We can clear away barriers that prevent Coloradans from receiving the needed life-saving Healthcare, And, you know, I want to say something here that I know has, I think, complete uh, and total uh, agreement in this room. You know, Colorado is the best state in the nation to live. Frankly, frankly, it isn't even close. And you know what? It's our job to keep it that way. Here in Colorado, we pride ourselves on our unbeatable quality of life, the breathtaking beauty of the state we proudly call home, protecting our special way of life for ourselves and for future generations is one of the most sacred responsibilities that we share that's on us. Not only do our majestic mountains and plains provide endless opportunities to enjoy our natural world with friends and family or to find solitude. They also are vital for our economic success. Colorado is now proudly the home of the Outdoor Retailer Show, a testament to our collective commitment to our public lands. We will continue to defend our public lands promote access to outdoor recreation, and do everything we can to support the outdoor industry's 230,000 and growing Colorado jobs. <laughs> While the outdoor recreation economy continues to expand opportunity in rural Colorado, we also want to double down on supporting Colorado's rich farming and ranching tradition.
And though our agriculture exports have nearly quadrupled over the last two decades, the last few years have been a difficult time for farmers and ranchers. Volatile commodities markets, a damaging trade war from Washington, an increasingly serious water shortage are all making life harder all too often for the men and women who work in our own farms in our agriculture industry. And we need to make sure that today's farmers and ranchers and tomorrow's have the tools they need to succeed. And I couldn't be more excited that our nominee for Agriculture Commissioner, Kate Greenberg, will be the first woman to hold that position. Kate, Kate has spent her career focused on the future of farming rather than the past, which is exactly what today's challenges call for. The lifeblood of our agriculture industry is water, which is why we must commit to continue the bipartisan and sustainable funding for the Colorado Water Plan. Governor Hickenlooper, along with the leadership of John Stolp, did an extraordinary work bringing together a broad coalition of Coloradans from all corners of our state to create the first state water plan, and we're going to do our part by improving and implementing that plan and partnering with organizations and our legislature to meet our current and future water needs. We will also partner with organizations like the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union's Co-op Development Center and others to reduce barriers to employee ownership and grow wages in agriculture and other sectors. And we'll work with the Rural Colorado Venture Capital Fund to expand access to capital and help the next generation of farmers and rural communities thrive. And we'll make good on the promise of industrial hemp here in Colorado. With our world-class universities like Colorado State and Adams State, which are at the forefront of hemp innovation and with the leading hemp manufacturers and cultivators already here, we want to seize on this opportunity under the most recent National Farm Bill to help make Colorado the national leader in industrial hemp production. Some of you might have noticed yesterday the programs for my inauguration were printed on hemp paper. <laughs> and when we talk about protecting Colorado's way of life, yes, we need to acknowledge and talk about climate change. You know, climate change, climate change is a scientific reality. It's real. There's no pretending otherwise for the farmers and ranchers who are facing historic water shortages. There's no pretending otherwise for the 46,000 men and women who work in Colorado's ski industry and see their jobs threatened by decreased snowpack. And there will be no pretending otherwise in this administration because we're going to confront this challenge head on, not only because we must, because we also want to take advantage of the huge opportunities associated with being a leader in the growing green energy economy. I launched my campaign for governor in Pueblo at an all-solar coffee roasting company just 10 miles from the Vestas wind turbine factory, which employs 800 Coloradans today building out the renewable energy economy. And I did so to demonstrate that our commitment to reaching 100% renewable energy by 2040 is not just about climate change. It's also about saving money for consumers with cheaper energy. It's about making sure that good-paying green jobs of the future 
are created right here in Colorado, and it's about making the future work for us. And today, the work begins to set Colorado on a course to reach that goal. That means modernizing both our grid infrastructure and streamlining our regulatory processes to ensure that all Coloradans are able to reap the full suite of benefits associated with swift adoption of renewable energy. It means working to electrify our cars and buses and trucks, and it means taking advantage of modern technology to use energy more efficiently, cleaning our air, making Coloradans healthier, and saving consumers money in the process. As Governor, my goal is to work with you to lead the statewide transition to a clean, sustainable, growing, and prosperous economy because it is an imperative for our climate, our security, our health, and economic growth for all Coloradans to address climate change. We will lead with policies that support, enable, and accelerate market investments. We'll work with stakeholders across Colorado on real outcome-based approaches that improve flexibility and competition and promote innovation and deliver emissions reductions from all sources uh, as well as save consumers money and lead to sustainable economic growth and a sustainable advantage for our industry based on lower green energy costs. We will build upon the significant work and commitment by communities, businesses, and people across our state. Today, 62,000 people are employed in advanced energy in Colorado. Excel Energy has committed to achieving 80% carbon reduction by 2030 and 100% carbon-free electricity by 2050. Communities like Pueblo and Summit County and Fort Collins and Denver and many others across the state have embraced strong climate goals. We're already leading the way forward right here in Colorado, and we will work every day to build on that process. You know, make no mistake, with price declines and technological advances, the move toward renewable energy is already taking place, and it will only accelerate. But as we embrace the renewable energy future, we also need to do right by the men and women in today's energy workforce, some of the hardest working people in Colorado. <laughs> and for the men and women who work in the coal and oil and gas industries, we will make sure that this future works for you. We will embrace the skills and experience that Coloradans from all backgrounds bring to the table because we need their help. And yes, your hard work will be needed and rewarded at every step of this transition. And we will continue to support the communities that these jobs have sustained to ensure that they can thrive too as part of our growing renewable energy economy. Creative financing mechanisms that exist today can ensure that consumers pay lower rates as we move to renewables and help provide for a just transition that is fair both for workers and for the broader communities that are directly impacted by this change. Colorado has always been and must always be a place where we respect the dignity of hard work. Providing for ourselves and our families is at the core of the Colorado way of life that we all love and a strong economy can't be built on any one sector or any one region of the state on its own. Our diversity is indeed our economic strength. Our mission is to help businesses of all kinds start, grow, thrive, and create good paying jobs across Colorado, from the Western Slope and the Eastern Plains to the Front Range in Southern Colorado and the San Luis Valley. We will value every job. We will respect every worker and every shareholder. We will protect the rights of workers to organize and collectively bargain for the pay and benefits that they deserve. <laughs> and 
and we support the rights of shareholders to govern their companies. And just as we stand up for workers in good jobs, so too we stand up for our communities. They have a right to have a voice when it comes to industrial activities within their borders that affect their quality of life and economic vitality. And yes, it's time for us to take meaningful action to address the conflicts between oil and gas drilling operators and the neighborhoods that they impact. We will work to make sure that every community has clean air and clean water. And this is a vital quality of life issue for Colorado families. To keep our economy moving in the right direction, we need to upgrade our antiquated roads and highways and limited public transportation options. They simply aren't equipped to sustain our growing 21st century economy. Thanks to the bipartisan commitment made last year to dedicate additional funds to transportation, we have hundreds of millions of dollars to improve our roads over the next few years. Now, that's a strong foundation to work from, but as we all know, it's not enough to meet the challenge, and we need to come together around a bipartisan funding mechanism to meet our current and future transportation needs that the voters of this state will accept and will continue to help our economy grow and Colorado to prosper. We also need to expand access to high-speed internet and broadband, and I'm eager to work with legislators to cut red tape that forces communities to go through costly and lengthy elections to build out their own broadband, and at the same time, we'll continue the good work of the Hickenlooper administration in supporting the creation of strategic regional broadband plans to really make high-speed internet access a reality across our state as efficiently as we can. Because in the 21st century and the changing economy, High-speed internet access is critical infrastructure that everyone must have access to at the risk of being left behind. So let's work together to make sure that no one in our great state gets left behind. So many of the important issues that Coloradans face today boil down to the word opportunity, a word I love. The opportunity to grow and start a business, the opportunity to enjoy Colorado's amazing way of life, our majestic outdoors, the opportunity to get a great education that leads to a successful future. But for Colorado to be a place where these opportunities are available for all and not just some, we need to make our economy work better for middle class families. And one way that we want to do this is by working with you to make our tax code more fair and more efficient so that we can reduce rates for Colorado families and small businesses. Our tax code simply gives too much power to the special interests who can afford expensive lobbyists while forcing ordinary families to pay too much in taxes. As, le as legislators, I know that many of you find these tax giveaways offensive. You know, unlike budget expenditures, which you get to vote on every year, these tax expenditures are on autopilot, some since the 1930s, before most of you, if not all of you, were born. We need a tax code that reflects today's realities rather than yesterday's distortions. Let's work together to help people keep more of their hard-earned money rather than give it away to special interests. The legislature and the auditor, thanks, for your, thanks to your efforts, have gotten off to a good start by closely examining uh, these various deductions and finding out which ones are being exploited at Coloradans' expense. And I want to work with you to close these loopholes and pass the savings on to families by lowering the income tax rate. For instance, many of the changes in President Trump's tax reform law 
were giveaways to the most influential corporations in the country. Some big businesses pay less, while many families here in Colorado actually have to pay more. So rather than blindly copy President Trump's policies into our state tax code, as we have done, we do not need to take the bad with the good. Instead, we should reflect the good in our tax code and change the bad to put families and small businesses ahead of special interests as nearly every other state under Republicans or Democrats has done, but we have yet to do. Also, 90% of the retailers in our state are small businesses. It's time to cap the vendor fee, which is a giveaway to the largest, most influential and profitable retailers in the nation, and use the savings to lower tax rates to benefit small businesses and millions of working Colorado families. That's extra money that families can use on home repairs, a college fund, or any of the innumerable expenses that folks are having a harder and harder time keeping up with the cost of living, which seems to keep going up. We want to make Colorado better for everyone, and broadening the tax base while lowering the rates leads to more economic growth and a stronger economy for all, and we look forward to working with you to seek tax efficiencies and clear-eyed policies that make everyone in our great state better off. And to be clear, our tax reform proposals will not change how much money the state collects or affect investment in public priorities one way or the other. Uh, it's simply about who pays. It asks the largest, most influential corporations to start paying their fair share so that individuals, families, and small businesses can pay less and don't have to pay for the tax loopholes that others benefit from. As we address these inequities in our tax code, so too we must address the inequities that are built in our criminal justice system. And that means tackling discriminatory practices that all too often make people of color and individuals living with mental illness or Coloradans experiencing poverty more likely to face longer and harsher incarceration. And it means working to make sure that Coloradans who do serve prison or jail time are able to live a dignified and fulfilling life after they've paid their debt to society. Criminal justice reform is an economic necessity, a human rights necessity. Uh, we will help you lead on this issue. And it's not easy, folks, but it is simple in one sense. Every one of us, every Coloradan, wants the opportunity to earn a good life. And if we can break down those barriers that hold us back by bringing high-quality early education to every family, lowering health care costs, creating good-paying jobs, here in Colorado and saving families money on their tax bill, we can help families get ahead. And what makes Colorado unique isn't just the boldness of our ideas, it's the resilience and the spirit of our inspiring people who make change happen, who truly bring bold ideas to life. Our shared responsibility is to turn challenges into opportunities, to turn ideas into action. Now is the time to unite in our common purpose, moving Colorado forward, taking good ideas from across the political spectrum, and turning those ideas into real results for Colorado families. Together, we will build a Colorado that works for all. Let's get to work. Thank you. God bless Colorado. God bless you. And thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Governor Polis. Will the committee escort the governor to his chambers? Majority Leader Garnett. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the message from the governor be printed in the House Journal. If there is no objection, the governor's message will be printed in the House Journal. Majority Leader Fenberg. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the joint session be dissolved. If there is no objection to Senator Fenberg's motion, the joint session will be dissolved. choice to make. I was talking to June and I was sorry that any impact on your relationship. Yeah,